to the Bar Stewards Inquiry Sunday Sermon. My name's Lee Keys, and with me, as ever, is my uh, uh, ca- uh, counterpart, John Lang, and a special guest this evening uh, for this special extended edition of the show. I am joined tonight by David Greenwood. Welcome, David. Good evening, gents. Uh, yes, good evening, sir. Um, uh, certainly looking forward to this one. Uh, David is a a professional punter, uh, been in the game a long time, and he's got many a good tale to tell, I can assure you of that. Uh, before I get on to that, I'd like to uh, start the show on a, on a, on a fun narrative. Uh, a good question, this online uh, sent by uh, <laughs> Dupont Tom, and it was a, a really good question. Who would train, gents, ride each of your horses if you, say, wanted to win the guineas, the champion hurdle, Five in a row at Southern, the cross country, the Ebo, and land a ten million to one treble. So, so I'm going to start uh, David off here, uh, the the the, uh, the guest. So, David, who would who would train or ride each of your horses if you wanted to win, say, the Guineas? Lee, I've just gone for the jockeys uh, for this this question, and I've gone Willie Carson in the thousand Guineas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Champion hurdle, Norman Williamson is right uh, on Alderbrook in the week where he won the Gold Cup as well. was fantastic. Uh, Kim Bailey double that week. I won't forget that yeah. in a hurry. Adam Kirby, all the all-weather tracks come alike. He's, you know, he's a serious jockey anyway, but the all-weather, especially in the winter, he stays, you know, he stays pretty much in, you know, in the country in the winter. Doesn't go to Dubai that often. Probably not going to Dubai at all this year with all the quarantine rules. He just looks a cut above most of the uh, all-weather jockeys. Um, cross-country, Andrew Thornton. I thought those long legs of his really helped him out if uh, he was going over all those funny obstacles. Uh, <laughs> Kier- Kieran Fallon for the e You know, fantastic, uh, fantastic sort of, well, fantastic jockey full stop. But um, I know, uh, I know he, he really did excel in, in races like them. And um, the 10 million, Frankie de Tory, just because I was thinking money wouldn't worry him too much. He wouldn't be he wouldn't be phased by the fact that people were set to win a lot of money. He's had the de Tory seven where Panthers won sort of 50, 60 million around the country and he still gave everyone a cracker. I think he just goes out. He rides um, every, you know, every horse well. And he's just class. You know, he's he's. He's the best. He's the best we've got now, and he's you know he's a good age. So, and he's probably been the best for a long time now. So I think Dottori's yeah. the, the nap there for the ten million. Some good answers there, David. Um, John, what would uh, what would you uh, go for? Well, in the guineas, I just wanted to be trained by Ed O'Brien because he just keeps winning guineas now, doesn't he? Um, and. Technically, you could more or less put anybody up, so I'd probably go with someone like Johnny Murta because I like Johnny and I like the same round loads of Kimmy's winners. Yeah, group one, Johnny, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the champion hurdle, uh, bit of a no brainer for me, James Franshaw and Richard Dunwoody. Um, Richard Dunwoody, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, the uh, the joke connection. Um, I think both his champion hurdlers went to went to the jokes for a bit of prep work and everything. Done what he did it, so I take that little crew together. Yeah. Um, Five in a row at Southall, um I'd look no further than Norma McCauley. <laughs> um, I think she would be absolutely ideal. The old man used to train on Renka race cars, and I'm there. Uh, I'll keep, I'll keep it a bit local there, and I'll, uh, I'll chuck um, Tony Ives in as a possible rider because he, he could uh, probably do the weight right the way through as it went up. <laughs> um, the cross country, as regards trainer, well, I'd just have to go with Mrs. Edna, Ed, Ed, Edna Bolger, wouldn't I, really? Um, Fine trainer is Edna. She's the best. Yeah. She's uh, she's up there with Jenny Pittman, isn't she? Really? Yes. yes. Um, and as for the jockey, I think uh, Rani Frost, really, because she's a bit of a nut bear as well, isn't she? Like see her on the front quick. Yeah. You know. Um, with regard to the Eber, um, 
I'd go for John Gosden because I seem to be backing one of his every year in the Ava. Each time a few of them started winning again. Um, obviously, he'd chub the Tory on because he's as good as he get around there. Um, yeah. The 10 million treble, um, I would look no further than the old Terry Ramsden crew. Alan Bailey was Peter Blomfield riding. Yeah. None of oh, them wow, say- that's- None of them say there's bad big money bets going on and uh, nicely under the radar as well because Phil Blomfield had no groupies whatsoever. So the price is an old up. Yeah, that's that's bringing back some memories there, John. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's good. Uh, it's good. Really good Really good choices. Um, guineas for me would be uh, Steve Cawthon, front end, uh, win behind, as at Newmarket, it often you know, helps a lot there. Just get on with it. Uh, the great HRA Cecil uh, as the trainer, no peers for me uh, in that department. Champion hurdle would be Johnny Frankham um, to ride uh, Matt, if he's off. Um, and um, Willie Mullins, the trainer, because of the uh, the juice angle. Good old, good old, good old Willie with the juice. We like Willie. Um, five in a row at Subtle would be David Barron, uh, who is... His strike rates there over years have been immense, something like 21%. Um, filmmaking would be the jockey, but you'd have to stick him a grand on each time to stop him going the other way. Um, the, cross <laughs> country, <laughs> the cross country for me would be uh, agreeing with you, John, good old Edna. And the jockey would be Paul Carberry. Um, all the Carberries are mad, mad as a, bo- mad as a box of frogs. Um, you know, they'll, they'll jump a 10 foot fence, no problem. Um, the Ebo, I agree totally with you, John. Uh, John Gosden and Frankie Dettore, just what a combo for a, for a nice long straight, you know, hopefully get that waiting ride uh, uh, to perfection. And the 10 million to one treble would be Gary Moore. And I'd have John Wayne right down as the registered trainer. Um, <laughs> uh, William Carson to ride. That's the, that's the modern day William Carson. He's good when the money's down. And you get your prices because he's not as mainstream as some of the other well-known ones. So that that combination there would hopefully land me my ten million to one because John Wayne Wright to have a treble in a day, you know, There's would nobody, be uh, nobody piggybacking on him, is there? I don't think so. So so yeah, um, that that would be my call there. Um, so yeah, great question, Dupont Tom. We had some fun answering that. Um, and uh, before we move on to um, uh, David's. Uh, uh, life uh, as, as a gambler so far. Uh, just one thing I wanted to cover off um, that sort of annoyed me this week. Um, the panel, uh, the BHA panel, uh, have uh, disqualified Maxime Tissier um, for nine months, in essence, uh, for basically what looks like to be recreational betting, placing £1,205 worth of bets in a William Hill shop, uh, ranging between £20 and 170 pounds, and and with a 591 pound loss, um, I, I I absolutely despair when I see things like this. Uh, it's clearly recreational. The lad's probably bored. He's not getting many rides. Any thoughts on 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 this, gents, for the for the punishment handed out? Well, he's he's going to probably get as many rides as he's had in the last nine months, isn't he? <laughs> um, but well, that you know, I mean. Uh, Totally disproportionate punishment. They could have had a word, you know, they didn't have, even have to go public with this. Um, the lads offended nobody by doing that. Um, a stern yeah. word would have been fine for me. Yeah. Just, just to tell you that Matthew Hopkins, he got a three-year ban a few, uh, a couple of years ago for the same sort of thing, betting in fivers. Uh, a nothing jockey, you know, a small small jockey who hadn't, hadn't ridden many winners. Um, basically had a gambling addiction and was just betting tiny, tiny amounts. He was working, I think, for Scott Dixon when uh, he got the problems. Got a three-year ban. And then when he appealed just to work as a work rider, saying that racing was the only thing that he knew what to do, they, they turned him down. So they wouldn't even let him work ride let alone ride in a race. And he got a three-year ban. This guy was not winning money. He was just betting on anything and everything. Two flies going up a wall. Tiny, tiny stakes. 
and got a three-year ban and wasn't allowed to even work in racing. Now, you know, if it's a mental health illness is, is gambling addiction. But if you turn up there and say, this, I've got a problem, that, that's how you get treated. Three-year ban. Thanks yeah. for coming. It, it just seems to me, through, through uh, we've been in this game a long time, the three of us, and um, it, it just seems to me it, it, it's who you are. If, if you're at the top table, you know, it, it's, it can even get skirted over. I've heard of instances where there's, there's been collars felt and nothing done. Uh, doesn't reach the public domain, or, you know, and 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 this is the thing: if if you're not at that top table, or it just seems to me it's just you know they make an example of you. It's ridiculous. The smaller you are, the bigger the kicking you're going to get. It's Pretty much, right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, they're yeah. not even handed at all. You know, it's disgusting. Well, I, mean, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I, I I haven't actually checked how many rides Maxime Tissier gets. On a year, to be honest, obviously he rides for Lucy Wadden. I, I, I actually don't know, but in effect, it's his also it's his, his livelihood. I mean, whatever amount of rides he gets, there's going to be income, so he's, he's lost all that income. So I just, I just think they should take it into account. You know, say, say a top jockey could afford any kind of fine or anything, but but this lad to take his sort of living away for nine months, I, I'm not so sure that's that's proportionate. Like we all we all agree on. Right, we move on. Um, David Greenwood, our, our special guest tonight, and and he's um, uh, if you're not aware, um, David was uh, banned by the BHA back in uh, 2015 um, for uh, a horse that he acquired ad vitam. Um, and now I'm going to let David uh, tell us what life is like inside a BHA inquiry, David. Well, they've got very nice offices, Lee. I can tell you that they're uh, in High Holborn. They're uh, they must be extremely expensive, considering there's there's very little money going around in some echelons in the sport. You know, stable staff, prize money, etc. Expense isn't spared in High Holborn. It's all very well, uh, very well maintained, and the offices are very plush, and uh, the rent must be astronomical. But uh, the best thing about it as well, very nice uh, sandwiches, top of the range every day during the seven day inquiry that I uh, that I attended. It was pre manger every day. It was top class with a full range. So that was that was the only uh, positive of the entire <laughs> experience, I would say. But j- just to just to put the listeners, uh, you know, who haven't been involved in a BHA inquiry, which will be pretty much everybody, I'd imagine. When you're a professional punter, unfortunately, the <coughs> racing authorities throughout history have not, not looked on you well. They've not, not particularly liked you. You know, of the people that I look through that have been warned off or, or been charged with different things over the years, some big names. I think Barney Curley got warned off for a bit. Terry Ramsden, the massive gambler. You know, Ladbrokes caused him a few problems, I think. Harry Finley. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, and then Martin Raymond, Bruce Raymond's son, he was charged, but but acquitted after spending a lot of money on lawyers. Um, yeah. And then some some people that we know, you know, Mark Aspie, Carl Flink, Christian Robson, Dave Stevens, Brett Lloyd, John Wright, Phil Langford, all just gamblers. And you're just in the firing line all the time. If you hit the pink button for any reason and then there's a dodgy ride and you're a professional gambler, there's an air of suspicion. You have to justify everything. Now, in my case, I didn't even have that. I didn't lay any horses that were, were, were mine or were, or were under suspicion. They, they went down this route of saying that a friend of mine had laid the horse. Now, I hadn't laid the horse for me, by the way. I had laid the horse because I had told him I didn't fancy the horse, which, you know, if... if, if I could tell you how many people over the years have told me they didn't fancy their horses, which I then turned yeah. the TV on to see them, you know, bolting up by six lengths. It's uh, it's it's almost a weekly occurrence, you know, to take uh, take advice from from friends and and, uh, you know, take advice from them really at, at arm's length, because a lot of people don't realize how, you know, racing is so, so unpredictable. And that's why 
you know, you see the gambles. Even last week, they said it was the, the biggest gamble for seven years. It was well set up. It, it had obviously been planned to the minute. And the third one's beaten, you know, beaten 10, 15 lengths. Landing gambles very, very hard. If you want to lay horses on information, on paddock, on, on little whispers, you're going to find that very, very hard as well. The truth of the matter is when you're gambling, it's hard work if you want to be a winner. It's 16 hour days, sometimes more. It's stress, it's pressure, it's cash flow management. And you've got to be incredibly resilient because even when you're doing everything right and you've been doing the same things that you've been doing for, for all your life and winning, those losing runs, they come and they seem to hang around for a long, long time. And you've really got to dig in and, uh, you know, and, and, and stay calm. And I think that's, that's something that's probably just about stood me in good stead. So just taking you all the way back, back in sort of, it, it's a funny story because back when I left university, I, I was actually a BHB graduate before they became BHA. So it was all very, it was all very good then. I was in the offices <laughs> for, for better reasons. And then I went to William Hill, worked on, uh, on William Hill Radio, that was all really good for you know a couple of years there. I was enjoying it. Uh, had a few oh. problems at the end, but it's a great. It was a great, a great station. Worked with a lot of good people, and then I moved on to Betfair Radio. Worked for them a little bit. But the lure of being your own boss and being a pro professional punter and not having to pay tax on your winnings, like I was paying tax on the earnings, was too much. And eventually, I just took the uh, took the decision. I'll start gambling. Now, the in-running gambling I was doing, I was doing mainly from the racetracks. So this is the funny thing now that I read about the drones. The racetracks are screaming about drones going up. There's drones over the racetrack. There's drones <laughs> over the racetrack. They couldn't wait to sell you the unused boxes that, you know, that they use once a year sort of, you know, on, on, on their big days. And they didn't use the rest of the year. They would sell you an empty box with a little bit of internet and a cup of cold coffee for five, six hundred pounds every meeting. And they would greet you with open arms. So, you know, it just uh, it, it just makes me just dismiss all this drone nonsense. You know, I don't know what the legalities of it are. I've no real interest in it. But I do think it's funny that the racetracks are are complaining about it now when, you know, they've, they've been greeting the in running punters for years and still would be if it wasn't for COVID, um, and taking the money for the boxes and for, for them to be able to trade on the, the live feed that you get at the track. So going racing every day, eventually you meet you know, a few different people and a couple have horses and you sort of, you sort of start thinking, well, I'll get involved. You know, cheap horses. I bought a couple of very, very cheap horses. I'd known the trainer, David Griffiths, from my time at William Hill Radio. He had done a little bit on there and he had just started up training. So one night I claimed this horse, Advertan. I, I wish I hadn't now. It was, it was just a shocking <laughs> bit of luck. I mean, why somebody else couldn't have claimed it and, and I lost out in the, in the ballot? It's just beyond me. It's like sliding doors, the way life could have gone. But uh, it was a cheap horse, £4,000. I ran it quickly because I was told that a Swedish uh, consortium were going to claim it if I ran it in another claimer. So I ran it in another claimer, then they didn't claim it. And we just ran the horse, ran the horse, ran the horse. Anyway, eventually the horse left my ownership because after goodness knows how many runs, I think it was 14 for David Griffiths and a lot for other trainers, you know, I just, I, the horse had a couple of injuries and I just gave it away. It was, you, it, was, it was basically useless. You know, it was a horse that was of limited ability and, and a very questionable ass attitude. I think it had squiggles and all sorts. <laughs> and I'd pretty much forgotten about the horse. But I'd had some BHA issues on a horse called Rumble of Thunder, a different horse, which had nothing to do with whatsoever. And um, it was basically, I'd laid it one day in a novice hurdle and I'd backed it another day in a handicap hurdle. Two completely different races. And they wanted to know why I'd, done, why I'd laid it 
on its first ever start over hurdles, but then decided three starts or four starts later to back the horse. And they said there was, you know, a pattern of lays. Well, we pointed out straight away that one lay isn't a pattern and that there were very different races. And at the, I think it was a week before the actual hearing, the charges against me and Carl Flint and Christian and Dave Stevens are all dropped. And I got a check to pay all the, uh, all the legal fees and all of that was sorted out. And I thought, lovely. That's great. It's sorted. We've done it. And then Mark Aspey and Richie McGrath still had to have a hearing about this horse and they were cleared. So I thought, well, you know, there was nothing to it. The BHA, they've got it wrong. We all move on with our life until three years after the horse's last run for me, you know, two or two years, maybe. But the, the case was probably three years. I'm getting uh, information saying I'm being charged with passing on inside information of my horse to a friend of mine who had laid the horse on a couple of occasions or three or four occasions. And, you know, and they wanted to know why. And they also uh, charged two of the jockeys that had ridden it for me, saying that uh, that they had ridden it not to, uh, you know, not to not to win, basically. So. I basically spoke to, you know, a couple of people, I got a lawyer, we went down to the to the hearing in High Holborn. And this is like three years after these races have taken place. You know, it was very hard for anybody to even remember. Well, you know, the jockeys couldn't really remember the races. I couldn't really remember the conversations that were asking me about. And everything just seemed a little bit a little bit strange really it was just it was so hard to work out what was going on there was folder and folder and folder of information that i you know i couldn't possibly read it all a lot of it wouldn't have even made much sense to me they had a barrister they had obviously solicitors looking after them and when i turned up on day one michael staten arrived he had been riding you know th this is london he had been riding, I think, at Catrick the night before, night before in the eight o'clock. I'd had a couple of hours sleep and driven down to High Holborn. You know, it's like a five hour drive, six hour drive. To start an investigation, to start a hearing that has, has got huge consequences to his, his whole livelihood. And then I, I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. I said, Michael, which one's your lawyer? Is it, you know, where is he? I can't see him. And incredibly, the PJA, unfortunately, don't have the funding for jockeys to have lawyers or barristers in the investigation. So Michael had no legal representation at all. He had wow. Paul Struthers in the hearing who, who, you know, again, just has luck would have it. Well, bad luck would have it. Uh, one of the jockeys got injured at, at Wolverhampton, a bad injury. And he had to he had to go and see the jockey and he missed a couple of days of the inquiry. So for two of the two or three of the days of the inquiry, Michael had no representation whatsoever. He had nobody there to help him out. And poor old Michael as well, from what I could understand, he's you know, he's a jockey. He's he's schooling and everything is is to a, a very lowish level. He's always been just you know, concentrating on being a rider. He has dyslexia. He couldn't even really comprehend all these documents that were in front of it. They just, they just meant nothing to him. And you're up against, you know, a, a, a top of the range barrister, the BHA don't employ, you know, Joe from the pub. They brought in a top <laughs> man and Michael's got, you know, the Paul Struthers, who's got no legal training, trying to defend him. Your whole career after being a jockey for 15 years, is you know is down to a guy who's doing his best for you but who, who is is certainly underarmed in this situation and i just felt very sorry for him really it was it was a long seven days i'm not sure why it took so long but david griffiths and his wife came down and and they gave evidence that you know obviously we disputed saying that i'd given instructions to the jockeys that they didn't agree with now, you know, I've been a gambler for a long time. I watch a lot of races. My view was 
I own the horse and I would know as much, if not more than anybody else about Wolverhampton and the, the opposition that we're up against. So, you know, it was my, it was my instructions and the fact the horse didn't win wasn't any different to, to most of its life, really. It didn't win very often for anybody. It had lots of trainers. I think poor old Suzanne France, she was in the paper a couple of weeks ago saying how, you know, how she loved the horse, but it only won for four times in six years. It wouldn't have been a great return. You know, certainly hasn't paid his, uh, certainly hadn't paid his way. And then you've got to remember as well that you look around the room and Michael's there and Paul Struthers is there and the panel they're paid. The the everyone's being paid by the BHA bar bar our, bar our side. You know, it's just like you just think, God, this everything's just a, a little bit against you because it's not. They don't need to find you guilty like the law the, in the courts do. It's a balance of probability situation, which again makes life tougher. Considering there are there are careers on the line. You know, and, and I just saw Holly Doyle in the paper and she said about a, a BHA stewards inquiry just a couple of weeks ago. She says, I'm fairly thick skinned, but I felt intimidated in the inquiry. I was repeatedly interrupted and spoken over. I couldn't get a word in. The tone in which I was spoken to backed me into a corner and left me no way to describe the incident. And Paul Struthers of the PGA called for the audio of the inquiry to be made public. That hasn't happened. There was no apology to, to Holly Dorr from the BHA. Instead, an unnamed BHA spokesman in the paper, I mean, why, why it's a spokesman who couldn't put their name to it, I don't know, said they were grateful to Holly for raising her concerns. You know, I just, uh, I just th think to myself, has anything changed? Because this is exactly how I felt that the two jockeys who were on, on my particular panel, I felt that's how they felt from what they were telling from what they were telling me but um you, you basically you go into this this room in the bha and they have two big tvs and they keep showing you the race showing you the race and the jockeys would explain what they were doing how they were riding the horses how the draws were affecting their you know their possibilities of even being able to win because a lot of the times Town got some very very bad rides uh, sorry, very bad uh, draws, which made the riding very tricky. Um, because Wolverhampton, if you're drawn out on the wing, you, you pretty much either got to drop in and pray for luck or stay out wide, and then you're going a long way round. So it just, everything just became very, very difficult. And it, it just becomes sort of almost a... Their, their, their barrister was telling the jockeys how they should have ridden. Their, their barrister, though, has never ridden in a race. You know, he, he, he's never ridden in a race. And there was nobody else in the room that had ridden in a race rather than the jockeys. But the jockeys were being told, you should have taken this gap. You, could, you should have taken that gap. You shouldn't have done this at that point. And, and it just becomes, it just becomes in, impossible because you just keep saying, well, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done that, and I had to ride it this particular way. And the horse isn't isn't any good, you know. You just look at the horse's career; it, it was it was very tricky, very hard to win with. Um, the, the, so, the, the, BH, the, the BHA cited though that that they said that you had um, booked uh, female apprentices um, on certain occasions, and then when the gamble was taking place. Apparently, they were ridden by Michael O'Connell and Martin Harley. Uh, is that is that is that correct, Dave? Look, they 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 made a big point of all of this, but you know, I was backing this horse so many times. I can't even remember how many times I backed it. I, he was a big loser for me, and you know, look, if I if I wake up in the morning, I look at a whole range. Before I have a bet, you can't just back a horse on a jockey. You've got to you've got to actually look at the the track, the trip, the going, the the opposition. You know, if I wake up and I think there's there's three absolute plots, 
I don't care. You know, Frankie the Tory's riding mine. I mean, I've got yeah. three horses, ten pound clear. I can't back them. But the thing is, when you've got the benefit of hindsight that the BHA had, they had. You know, they've got. They're looking back at events three years ago, and you can you can pinpoint different things, and you can say you did this because, you did that because. But it but they didn't want to listen to the other the other arguments. It was their way. And and they wouldn't they wouldn't listen to what I was telling them. And and it sort of comes back to poor old, you know, even John Wainwright, um, you know, a small trainer again who got called up in the Adam Car Carter um, affair and got, uh, you know, and, and got cleared. And his lawyers afterwards were saying the BHA, they really are win at all costs, you know, people that that they didn't feel like he should have ever even been charged and put through the the situation because Adam Carter kept changing his, you know, his story and everything like that. And John Wainwright got cleared. But even the people that got cleared, and I spoke to Martin Raymond about this, you know, it's, it, even if you get cleared, it's a very expensive process. If you turn up with a, with a legal team and you, you're there for sort of three, four days, you have to have preparation and everything. I think Martin Raymond spent like twenty, twenty-five thousand pounds on on lawyers. Just it it just makes life very, very difficult. What was the um, what was the crack with um, David Griffiths? I mean, I mean, why was he so against you in the uh, in the evidence? What 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 what? Why do you think he was like sort of uh, you know like well basically insinuating that 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 you've been cheated basically? Yeah, you know, that's that's something I've never really understood. I've never spoken to David. You know, I spent a lot of money with him as a, as a young trainer, really supported him. Um, so I was disappointed because, you know, I probably spent tens of thousands of pounds. I think we had one winner from a few horses. It was a measly return for, for my money. I think, you know, if you looked at the prize money compared to the training fees, whew, it would be a horrible uh, balance sheet, you know. And yeah. uh I supported him. He was just getting started. I thought he he was a friend. I always got on well with him at William Hill Radio. And look, Advertan was there for 14 starts. You know, he didn't win. 14 starts. He did and, and we're at we're at a low low level. So I gave the horse a break at the end of the year because it was November. And when I brought the horse back the following year after a little break. I chose a different trainer, a more experienced trainer at the time, because I just felt like it had it had the horse long enough that the horse should have won, and it hadn't won, so I moved on. Now, why he then was so vociferous, you know, sort of four years later, I'm not sure, because if he wasn't happy, you know, if he wasn't happy with me as an owner, he could have he could have told me to leave, you know, six months before if he'd wanted to. Yeah. So, but but you know that didn't happen. But you know when it came down to it, we were talking about different rides, and he didn't want certain jockeys. You know this this is this isn't just David Griffiths. This is what I found with a lot of trainers. You pay the bills. Uh, you know, as the owner, you pay the bills. But if you want to choose your jockeys or the race or the tactics or you want the input, they don't like it. And that's what I found actually with with nearly every trainer I ever use. They just they think they almost own the horses and uh, that uh, they uh, should do uh, as they uh, as they wish. Uh, uh, Mark Johnston with that deal. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine had asked me Mark Johnston and uh we went down there to watch it work and that, you know, and uh, I made it clear what we wanted doing with it the first time up. And uh, he said to me, uh, he said, well, I've trained 2,000 winners and uh, I've never given a jockey instructions yet. And <laughs> I, I said, well, how do you know you wouldn't have trained 3,000 if you'd been giving him instructions? And he didn't wait. Well, no. Well, he, exactly. I, I found this a lot in racing. I found, like, you know, people who put a trainer's badge on, they certainly thought they were, you know, not to be questioned and certainly not to be questioned by a punter. 
Panthers have a bad reputation, unfortunately. We're looked down on, even though we're funding the entire sport that's taking place um, to, to a good extent, as, along with owners, you know, really funding it all the way down the line. We, we are not looked on well, you know, and, and I've heard you say this before, Lee, when people say, what do you do? The last thing you want to say now is I'm a punter, I'm a professional punter. You just you just yeah. make something up. You're better off saying you know I'm a plumber. Yeah, don't don't tell Peter Shilton. No, <laughs> no. Oh, he'd be sickened. Yeah. Um, I mean, just coming coming back to to your case, Dave. I mean, um, and and uh, th- these reports are available in in yeah. public for anyone that wants to read them. Um, and I I was honestly shocked. I mean, um, I I could not believe on their conclusions that they handed out. Uh, a six-year plus two uh, suspension uh, on what on what I read. Um, basically, you were not guilty on so many counts. Um, and the only thing that I can see that that sort of landed you in sort of hot water, if you like, was basically uh, mentioning uh, to, to friends of yours that uh, you weren't backing your horse today. Uh, in essence, um, well, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, and to me, and and obviously the second part was obviously not disclosing uh, your your phone records, which obviously they, they always take it in view of that, and as 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 you'd expect. But but <clears throat> apart from that, they had absolutely nothing, which is remarkable, really. Lee, how many people do you see in the questionnaires now about the affordability in gambling? If you put up a questionnaire and you say to people, will you give all these organisations, all your bank details, all your personal details, are you going to hand them over? You'll find <laughs> at least 60 or 70 percent of people saying no. And, yeah. and, you know, we've got a real crisis coming up with this, with with punting and, uh, you know, and uh, everything around that. But that's a different story. But. The, 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 the question is, should I, you know, for a start, it took three and a half months to even get a result, which just seemed an extraordinary long time. I mean, I'd almost forgotten that the case had even taken place by the time I got a phone call telling me what the result was. I mean, how could yeah. it take three and a half months? But, you know, apart from that, eight years, it's, it's exactly the same to the day as Mahmoud Al-Zaruni got for injecting quality animals, not, you know, we're talking, which ran in group races and won group races for, you know, in, in, the, in some of the most famous silks going, running, running in, in the most prestigious races, bringing the entire game at the very top level to, in complete disrepute. And they're saying, I should get, I should get the same ban as him. I was just flabbergasted. I was I was flabbergasted. But fortunately, because I'm not a trainer or a jockey, it didn't affect me too. It doesn't well, it doesn't affect me. You know, I'm not gonna ever be a trainer, I'm not gonna be a jockey, and I'll never go horse racing in this country again. And I'm actually the only one thing I'm gutted about is I never went to Chester because it's the only track that I've not been to, but I'll I'll live with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we're kind of getting pushed for time here. I mean, I tell you what, we, I tell you what we, we need to do because basically covering this off in one episode is is more or less impossible. Um, it is. So I think. So I think. I think this is going to be part one um, because <laughs> there's, there's a few other things that I'd like to go through, and I'm sure you would um, in, in terms of what happened. But in the meantime, if anybody does want to to, to read the report. Um, You'll only come to the same conclusion that I did that that, that <laughs> the punishment I don't think that fits the crime in any shape or form. John, John, did you get a chance to read the report? I did, yeah. The, the conclusion I sort of drew from it really was to look at Dave's betting records and assumed he was making money on bet races and they. Couldn't prove it, but they're giving six years extra for luck because of that. Uh, it, it, pretty much, I, I've never. I don't think I've ever seen a disqualification of that length. I mean, normally, right? By the way, the uh, there is also like list of amounts of of, of apparently the the lay bets etc. Um, and 
I don't really see that much that much untoward in terms of like in, in terms of punting. Um, I, I I really don't. So I, it, I think it, we just cross reference and we realise that they think we're bent heads myself. Yeah, yeah. He's, as, as I said, I mean, I, I get I get why they'd want to throw the book for for hiding phone records, and I've, I've heard David's response in terms of of why he, he wouldn't give them. And I, I I understand people will not give their data, um, personal data, when he, David obviously felt he didn't have to. Um, but I think what we'll do is, because uh, like I said, we are short of time. Um, it, it's a forty five minute show, and obviously, if you're out walking, listening to this or or whatever, um, it, it kind of it, we don't really want to overrun too much. So I think we'll do a part two, um, uh, pro- hopefully next week, if not next week, very soon uh, to, to, to this episode, because I know David has got so much to say in terms of uh, stories, tales, um, and, and you know, it's, it's just just times basically caught up on up on us here, sadly. Um, but um, as I said, it, it's, it's a really interesting topic that needs need, needs covering, and, and I, we're pleased that David's actually coming on the show to, uh, uh, to to share his side of the story and, and basically, you know, make you aware of, of what he actually went through, um, you know, at, at the time of his uh, disqualification. Um, David, I believe also, I, I believe also, you've got a, a horse for us uh, that you think will win next time. Are you confident it'll win next time? I am. Yeah, just uh, a horse that I thought caught the eye. I know it's only a three-runner race, and it's a very good horse anyway, but um, a horse called Speaking Colours uh, at Dundalk. It came second on the 5th of Feb. I've just got a feeling that Harry's Bar, who's gone out to Saudi Arabia for a big, uh, a massive race out there, was absolutely tuned to the minute, whereas Speaking Colours, first run for uh, 111 days, possibly just needs it. I think Speaking Colours is going to be a serious, well, it is a serious animal. It's going to be, you know, going to be a winner next time out, that's for sure. Probably a horse that's going to win... Uh, you know, possibly a group one, definitely group twos this year. Yeah. Who, who, who trains? Is it Joseph O'Brien that trains? It is, yeah. Joseph O'Brien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting runner. Um, yeah, I mean, so I apologise to listeners this week uh, in terms of time frame. It's very difficult to fit it all into one show. So hopefully, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get the real juicy parts um, next next week from David if we can get him to, to sit down if he's available. And, um, and hopefully... Um, it will be certainly interesting listening. Um, That's all from me, John and David for for now. Um, Have a good weekend. Bye for now.